All right, so hopefully you guys can hear me. We'll get started in uh, just another minute or two. I wanna allow enough people uh, to log in if they are tuning in live and then we'll jump on into it. All right, so we will get started. And if you guys happen to not be able to hear me, let me know. Okay, awesome, so this is working. Excellent, so we are going to get started. We're gonna jump on into this. And um, as always, remember that all of the webinars are recorded. You will be, we, you will be receiving that recording as well as the PDF to this and any supporting research articles that I use to develop this PowerPoint. So thank you guys for taking the time to tune in live or if you are listening to this in an archive, thank you as well. Um, I do apologize that my voice is a little uh, on the shaky side. I taught a core class tonight and I am very enthusiastic when I cue. And I don't stop talking for the entire 30 minutes and I always get, uh, I lose my voice always in that core class, which is so funny. So we're gonna jump on into this, talking about homeostasis in human movement. And this is a approach that maybe you didn't know how I was going to use this concept of homeostasis and how it applies to our patients and our clients. Um, I had a few people respond and say, no, I don't think it's really homeostasis in human movement. So just hear me out on the way that um, I use the homeostasis theory and then apply it with my patients, particularly those who have chronic pain or um, kind of an unresolving hamster wheel type movement dysfunction. So as we get started, you are familiar with who I am, hopefully. Um, key thing that I would want to add into that is that my practice in New York is built around functional medicine, functional podiatry, regenerative medicine. I do a lot of stem cells. And I recently had shifted my practice away from more conventional into that holistic, complete, integrative approach with my patients and focus on how mind-body connections, stress levels, um, breathing patterns, nutrition, inflammatory levels affects their um, movement longevity or the quality of their movement. And that's really what I'm targeting with um, my practice. So shifted even more away from conventional podiatry. So this will be a little bit of an exploration on how I use the homeostasis theory with my patients. And then um, I'm gonna give a case study or case presentation on a patient that I recently saw and how I use this with her as an example. So again, I wanna take this as a new approach. This is also the, um, 
time of the year where, you know, for those who have followed EBFA for a while, you probably have noticed that there's a shift in our education. I am tying in a lot more of the emotional side, the interoceptive, um, really linking in how breathing influences the body, um, meditation, things like that. So we're actually doing a whole rebranding of EBFA, which is super exciting. And Kennedy is probably excited to hear that as well, where we're redoing the website. That's part of the branding, but we're reshaping our education around the brain, breath, and barefoot. So it's going to be a much more holistic approach for our patients, for our clients, and for athletes. So really diving into neuroplasticity and autonomic nervous system, and of course, sensory stimulation to tie it back into that barefoot stimulation. So we're going to kind of take that approach as we go in through the rest of this webinar and thinking about the homeostasis theory. And why this is so important is because we want to be treating the whole person, not just a symptom. So challenging conventional way of looking at um, pain, movement dysfunction, chronic pain, um, you know, we'll focus primarily on the movement side of things because that's, we're, we're all movement specialists. But even when you have you know, knee pain, are you just treating the symptom of that knee pain or are you looking at kind of the bigger picture? And that bigger picture that we're going to be taking a look at is going to really be tying in this concept of homeostasis. So homeostasis, when you look at it from a definition perspective, is how your body maintains an internal stability. So from a emotional perspective, your body is continuously doing this self-assessment or internal assessment to see how you feel. Are you thirsty? Are you tired? What's your heart rate? Do you have pain? And you're then interpreting this internal gauge that you're constantly assessing, even if you don't realize that you're doing it, you're, you are constantly doing this. And then you are creating a reaction or a, a response based off of that sensation that you had. So here in this example, if you were thirsty, your action is that you're driven towards getting a drink of water. Or if you have pain, you're going to obviously avoid pain, fatigue, you're going to rest. So the concept of homeostasis drives our behaviors and drives our actions. When we think of it from this internal assessment or this self-check, this is where we can go back to interoception. And I had done a webinar on intro to interoception, and then I did a webinar series on interoception. So I'm going to mention it briefly. But when you think of homeostasis theory, what you do want to start thinking about is your body is, the homeostasis is from an internal perception perspective. And that internal perspective is interoception, right? So we were tying in interoception with fascia, and then how can we link in influencing our clients' emotions through motion? So that was a big thing that we spoke about at the Barefoot Summit. That really was the point of why I did those webinar series. So now we're going to say, okay, instead of how can we influence our client's emotional state with motion? And then that's linked to interoception. We're now going to take it to a client that's in pain or has a movement dysfunction. And I'm going to show you exactly how I use that with my patients. So again, this perception of self, interoception, if you happen to not tune into the interoception webinar that I did or this series, please know that that is available. It's in the EBFA shopping cart. You can shoot me an email and I will send you the direct link for that. Um, it really goes in depth on the evolution of emotion and empathy. And I thought it was a very um, powerful series as far as how I look at the way my patients respond to just stimulation in general. Um, or stress, et cetera. So again, anything that is related to interoception, that is your fascial system as well. So it's, it's a type of a free nerve ending. 
and it links into the insular cortex, which is kind of the limbic side. So it's a very primitive side of the brain. And that's what's linked to that perception of self. Knowing that our fascia is linked into emotion. So any movement that you do is going to connect you back to both exteroceptive, proprioceptive, as well as interoceptive or that emotional self-regulation um, or kind of that barometer of how are you feeling from an internal perspective. What's interesting when you look at the fascia from an extraceptive to interoceptive uh, ratio is that you have a greater number of interoceptors compared to exteroceptors or proprioceptors, which is quite fascinating. If we look at the number, 80% of the peripheral nerves in our fascia are considered free nerves. And then of those free nerves, 90% of those free nerves are actually interoceptive. And a lot of this is actually going to lie within your visceral fascia. So, which is going to tie in to the next thing that I'm going to speak about, which is going to be linking into breathing. So visceral fascia, obviously belly, is within the vicinity and is even attached to the diaphragm. So now you can see how we're going to start linking this concept of homeostasis theory, self-regulation and checking internally, that's your interoceptors that do that, and then it's going to link to your breathing. So real quick, this is just kind of side to side comparison of them, free nerve endings versus myelinated with the proprioceptors. Interoceptors is activating the insular cortex or the limbic system. Proprioceptors are gonna be somatosensory, so they have to do with movement. And then there's a delay with interoceptors. Proprioceptors are obviously very fast because they are controlling movement. So our body is constantly seeking emotional stability. This is key. And we don't even realize that our body is doing this. And the way that you want to interpret emotional stability is safety. So your nervous system is seeking that you feel safe. When you are safe, then your nervous system will, will kind of be like, okay, all systems go, we're ready to, you know, run or whatever, or climb the stairs, you know, whatever the, the movement, if you're tying it to human movement. So we're using this kind of interchange between stability and safety in order to have peak um, stability within the musculoskeletal system. You can tie that back even to safety. So a way that we have this used a lot is Let's say if your hip joint is not stable, the deep hip joint is not stable, and then the more global muscles that are more superficial, your glute and your TFL, your piriformis, QL, all of these muscles lock down because that joint from a neuromuscular perspective is not feeling safe right? So that's another way that you can start to kind of tie this concept of safety and stability. If the deeper joint was stable, meaning all the deep local stabilizers were activating and they were activating in the right coordinated order and they were fast, that would be a stable joint, which would be also perceived as a safe joint. And then the rest of the muscles can activate within sequence and you would obviously have higher force and higher performance etc so you can interchange those from a joint perspective when you look at movement compensation i've seen a lot of professionals doing that i do do that as well and i will actually explain that to patients when they're not understanding why they keep getting piriformis syndrome and i tell them that i'm like your your nervous system has to know that it's safe for you to go into a single leg stance. If, you're, if your nervous system doesn't feel like it's safe in that single leg stance, it's gonna lock down all those global muscles. So it's, it's a way that you can also help them to understand. If we bring this back towards the homeostasis again, this is linking and the interoceptors is linking towards your autonomic nervous system. So anytime that you are associating with the homeostasis theory, you are thinking, okay, what is the status from a parasympathetic versus sympathetic state? And that's 
kind of the names that you would give an accelerated heart rate. You feel the accelerated heart rate, but you know that they're shifting into a sympathetic, into a sympathetic state. Now, 80% of the parasympathetic system is formed by the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this, but the vagus nerve is a very long nerve. It's a wandering nerve, it innervates all the, the viscera, and it's really helping to control the digestion and the heart rate and swallowing, um, gag reflex. It's controlling so many things with this subconscious side of our nervous system. And when you're thinking of vagal tone, really the more, the higher the vagal tone that you have, the quicker you are able to bring your nervous system back down to a parasympathetic state. So you get excited, but then you're quickly into getting back, okay, we're good, right? That's really what we need. So we're always going to be encountering stress and stressors, but after you encounter that stress, can you reset your nervous system quickly so that you're not stuck in that sympathetic state? And vagal tone is something that I spoke about quite a bit in that interoceptive series. So to bring this back a little bit more towards our patients, our clients, our movement dysfunction, is that the vagus nerve, which is what we're thinking about from a parasympathetic state, is going to link you back to interoception, which is going to link you back to emotion. So emotion, the way that you're perceiving the state within, that's your homeostasis, is going to then <coughs> be interpreted and create a certain emotion. That autonomic nervous system with the vagus nerve is also innervating the diaphragm. So all of that regulation that we were just speaking about is clearly going to start influencing your breathing. So breathing is really important. And particularly within the fitness industry, we focus a lot on diaphragmatic breathing. That's what we speak about in EBFA's education is we teach diaphragmatic breathing. I have a lot of my patients do diaphragmatic breathing. And really the point of that is that you're trying to get them into a sub-diaphragmatic state. When your breathing is below the diaphragm, that's when you're starting to stimulate the parasympathetic system. If it is supra diaphragm or above the diaphragm, then they're going to be more in a um, sympathetic state. And we're going to go exactly into why that is happening. So I'm going to go into a style of breathing. So this is analgesic breathing, which could technically be used. So if you understand this and, you know, let's say you're going to get you know, a procedure done and you're trying to control your pain or you happen to have, you know, knee pain or whatever it is, is understanding how you can alter your breathing pattern to actually decrease your perception of pain. And that is referred to as an analgesic breathing style. So to decrease your perception of pain, what you want to do is take a deep inhalation and then you're going to hold. Because it is subdiaphragmatic, you're then tapping into the parasympathetic system. You're holding it, which is allowing you to stay within that parasympathetic state. And what's happening when you go subdiaphragmatic is that you are influencing baroceptors, which respond to um, different pressures and different. Um, gases that are circulating throughout the body. So you want to be stimulating those baroceptors. And when you stimulate the baroceptors through subdiaphragmatic breathing, essentially you are decreasing contractile tone. When you decrease the contractile tone, you decrease the, decrease the sympathetic nervous system feedback. So there is a direct relationship between emotion, breathing, baroceptors, and perception of pain. So the way that I use this with my patients is that when I'm doing um, injections for them and if I'm doing different um, procedures, I don't do nail procedures anymore, but when I would take off nails, <laughs> which I actually enjoy doing, um, and doing thinking like an ingrown nail procedure, they get very excited and they feel pain even though they're numb. And these patients swear up and down that they can feel it. So I'm going to speak about that in a moment. Essentially, what they're doing is they're getting so worked up that they're altering their breathing style. And it's 
shifting their nervous system into a sympathetic nervous system, right? So now their stress markers go up, but from a deeper perspective, that's altering the way that these baroreceptors are being influenced, and that's what's increasing their perception of pain. So they're going to have a higher um, perception of pain or at lower thresholds, the more that they're getting a little bit excited. And you can actually see a correlation between anxiety and depression have increased pain. So they have a lower pain tolerance for those patients or clients who have an anxious personality or depressed state. And both of these, anxiety and depression, alter the breathing style. And as soon as you start to alter that breathing style and you stay super diaphragmatic, we know that you're altering the baroreceptor response, and now they're going to have a lower pain tolerance. So you can see that direct correlation. So when I have a patient that's, again, in that style, I understand that, okay, if I'm going to be doing something that's going to create pain for them, I need to understand this breathing technique and then how that's going to influence the perception of pain. You could also say that the rate of fibromyalgia and um, let's say autoimmune or diffuse joint pain, different arthritis is going to be higher in those who have an anxious state. So they may um, have a exaggerated response to a pain stimulation. And this is very common when you start encountering chronic pain patients, which is what a lot of us are going to be encountering, is they've had chronic low back pain, chronic SI joint pain, chronic hip pain, chronic groin pain, et cetera. And they've been to a bunch of different doctors and it's not going away. And now every certain subtle thing is um, creating a pain response where you would probably be like, there's no, how is that that painful? There's no way that you're in that much pain walking from the bathroom to the, to the kitchen. You know what I mean? So that's referred to as allodynia. And the rate of allodynia is higher in chronic pain patients. And an allodynia is going to be um, the response to a stimuli is not matching what you would typically um, expect with that stimulus. So it would be this exaggerated reaction to a certain stimulus. This is actually linked to breathing as well. And what you can have is what's called an emotional allodynia breathing. And this is going to be more of a sympathetic style. And emotional allodynia breathing actually increases what's called neurogenic inflammation. And if you're not familiar with neurogenic inflammation, it's essentially a nervous system driven inflammatory response which is it's a critical part of the way that your body fights infections and things like that because it's going to increase vasodilation it's going to bring histamine obviously it's going to bring blood to the area which helps to start bringing white blood cells and all of that stuff when you're thinking an infection however you can have exaggerated neogenic inflammatory responses and this is where you start to get an uncontrolled increase of substance p so substance p is perceived as pain you get an increase in nitric oxide we know that that's a vasodilator so now you have swelling to the area and a release of histamine now you have um, the permeability through your vessel walls increases so now right? Everything can start to pass. And that's often associated with more um, swelling or inflammation as well. Some examples of neurogenic inflammation is migraines is a great example. Fibromyalgia is another really good example as well. And that's where you're seeing that the influence of the breathing style is triggering this neurogenic inflammatory response, which is creating Etc. So that's where you could say people who have um, uh, like very anxious style are also very susceptible to migraines, or it's a very anxious uh, client or patient who, of course, would get the autoimmune condition, right? So you can start to see that what's really linking that is go back to the webinar series that we did on interoception, and they're probably very disconnected from their identity of I am. And 
those who don't have a high interoceptive awareness are of course going to be more anxious and they don't realize that they're more anxious and then they alter their breathing and they don't realize they're alter their breathing and then they stimulate this neurogenic inflammation and now they get chronic migraines or they get you know chronic um, autoimmune conditions etc dermatitis and things like that so you can actually start to see these patterns based on um, understanding that whole interoceptive side so what we want to do particularly from um, being a doctor, physical therapist, even movement specialist, is when you're dealing with a client, an athlete, or a patient who's in pain, instead of it, it being very exteroceptive. So this is a doctor addressing foot pain and is just kind of poking around, okay, does it hurt here? Does it hurt here? Okay, so if it hurts here, I'm going to be addressing it from a very exteroceptive perspective. What I challenge us to do is to take the concept of pain from being exteroceptive and more, does it hurt here? Okay, it hurts right on your patellar tendon, therefore you have patellar tendonitis. And try to bring it a little bit more towards the interoceptive and thinking of what are the possible emotional drivers or interoceptive drivers with these clients and these patients' pain cycle. So why is it, and this is really how you could start looking at, you know, how can you have, let's say, 10 people who all have the exact same degree of arthritis in their knee joint and Two of them are completely debilitated, can't even go up the stairs or whatnot. And then, you know, another few are fine, but they just feel it when the weather changes. And then other people are like doing ridiculous, crazy CrossFit and box jumps and pistol squats and all these things. So that's where you can't look at pain from just an exoceptive perspective. You have to think of why is subject A feeling the exact same uh, exoceptive presentation different from subject B. And that's deeply gonna go into their emotional state, their interoceptive state, their safety state, right? Their breathing patterns, their baroceptors. So all of that is going to be very important when you're looking at these patients. And then some of them may have that allodynia, so they have that exaggerated side. So when we think of pain, whether it's joint pain or whatnot, is we always want to think of there's a sensory component and it's going to be balanced with or integrated through that motivational component, which is always that interoceptive. And then how can we use that with our clients or with our patients who have um, different pain, et cetera. So we now want to tie this in even further into human movement and the concept of breathing. And I'm going to show you even more how I use the homeostasis theory in human movement. And we're going to be linking that into walking. So walking to me is the baseline of fluidity or movement balance. So to me, homeostasis is, is a very balanced state. It's your, your internal kind of self-check. Are you balanced? Are you safe? That's the way that I look at walking and human movement is walking should be just like this sine wave. It should be very balanced. It should be very rhythmic. It is a safe state for your nervous system and your fascial system and your musculoskeletal system. It's a very rhythmic, easy movement for, for our nervous system, for our body. And it was really critical in the progression of, or the evolution of homo sapiens and who we are now which is very similar to the evolution and the advances of interoception and the higher identity with I am essentially paralleled at the same time as the evolution of bipedalism. So we can take that concept and kind of carry it over into ambulation. I'm going to show you exactly how I do that now. So with walking, 
Again, walking is rhythmic. So just like that sine wave is the way that I look at my patients when I'm thinking of it. I'm thinking of their emotional state, their breathing pattern is very sinusoidal, very rhythmic back and forth. And then I think of their walking has to be rhythmic as well. And when we think of walking, and this is how I encourage you to think about walking, is that walking is designed to be hydrating our integrated fascial system through the coiling and uncoiling of rotations or spirals that are powered by the potential energy of impact forces. So that's really how I look at walking. And I take that concept and have my patients understand that walking is based on momentum and it's a rhythm. They want to find that rhythm. And that rhythm is what's driving a pendulum, which carries your swing leg forward into your stance leg. And then you're going to reciprocate it on the other side, swinging that leg forward until it's a stance leg, et cetera. Requires very little energy. You are using and working with the ground with every step that you're taking. You just need to work with the ground. And when you work with the ground, like I said, it requires very little energy. And that is critical from a survival perspective, just like the homeostasis and your internal perception of your emotional state, how that links to breathing also links to survival. And you want it to be efficient. You don't want to have a very volatile emotional state. You want to be calm and in control, just like with your walking. Now, the requirements for the rhythm of walking is going to be fascial elasticity, you need an optimal stride, mate, stride length, pelvic and T-spine rotations. Of course, you need ankle mobility, you need dorsiflexion of the first MPJ, but for the sake of this and the sake of the homeostasis theory, is I want you to focus on the optimal stride length and the pelvic T-spine counter rotations. These are critical. If you do not take a sufficient stride length. So each step that you take to really tap into the rhythm of walking, it must be of a certain length. Most people, a lot of people, and unfortunately with cars and a little bit more sedentary style, most people, you know, their steps for the day are around their house, to their car, and around the office. And all of those steps are actually very different than the way that our body was actually designed to be walking. And our bodies were designed to be walking out in the open, not carrying a bag, and obviously not holding something in the other hand, but having the freedom of the limbs, having wide open spaces, and then being able to take very long strides at a certain pace. When you do that, that is the driver of the pelvic and the T-spine rotations. As soon as you start to shorten your stride, which is what we do around our house, around the office, because you don't need to take a big stride because you're going, what, 10 feet, right? So then the shortened stride you do because of the style of walking you're doing starts to take away and restrict your rotations, your pelvic and your T-spine rotations. So to truly tap into that, you have to be able to get that stride. Now, let's say that is not related to the fact that you are walking short distances. Let's say that you are taking short steps because your pelvis is not stable. Now, this is where we could tie in that homeostasis theory and start to say, okay, is their pelvis not stable because the deeper muscles, the local muscles are not activating fast enough. And for those who've taken any training through EBFA, you know, hopefully, <laughs> that if your di diaphragm is not working properly and sufficiently and rapidly, then your pelvic floor is not going to be stable. Your deep rotators are not going to be stable. Your psoas is not going to be stable. So now you've completely lost the ability to stabilize your pelvis and the purpose of stabilizing your pelvis is to get into a single leg stance and that single leg stance is critical to the evolution of bipedalism but is critical to how we create homeostasis in walking 
homeostasis being the sinusoidal rhythm load and unload coil uncoil. That's what we're trying to do. That allows your proprioceptive fascial system to stay in balance. So if you notice that in a client and you look at their walking pattern and you see that they're taking short staccato steps is starting to say, okay, well, are they doing that because their hip flexors are tight or can we go back a little bit deeper? And remember, we want to look very holistically and say, okay, is the driver of this pelvic instability their diaphragm? And if it is their diaphragm, can we just simply say, do diaphragmatic breathing, or do we have to dive a little bit deeper? Do we truly need to start reconnecting some of our clients into this concept of interoception and bringing them into a interoceptively aware state? Then they'll be able to get more out of their diaphragm. If you just tell them to do diaphragmatic breathing, they may not be able to connect with that because they lack the internal awareness or the interoceptive awareness. So that's gonna be something key. Or you could start to say, do they have a loss of pelvic stability because they feel pain when they're moving? And then do they feel pain when they're moving? That's true pain. Or is it exaggerated pain, which is the allodynia, which is hard to, hard to differentiate. If you go back and you say, okay, well, they have more of an anxious, um, anxious personality. They're in a very supra diaphragmatic breathing pattern. We know that those styles are um, more associated with allodynia. Maybe it's a client that is always complaining of some pain. So you could start to see almost like an exaggerated pattern within that client. Then you could start seeing again, okay, obviously you handle it in a smart way. You don't disregard their pain and tell them that they're exaggerating it. But you're mindfully building it into their program and into their treatment to go back to that interoceptive, go back to the diaphragmatic, get them into a state that they're going to stimulate the baroceptors the right way, which that in itself will decrease the perception of pain. So <clears throat> the way that I want to wrap this up is with a case presentation of a patient that I saw recently. And this was a patient that flew to New York to see me. She's from um, the Midwest somewhere, small, small town in the Midwest, and has had chronic pain for over 30 years and has seen probably 20 doctors. And her pain that she's experienced for the past 30 years has been in her SI joint and her right hamstring. She brought, she was an amazing historian, which many patients who have pain for that long usually are very good historians. And she came to me because she wanted to, one, have me look at her whole presentation outside of the box, looking at things a little bit differently. And then she thought possibly the missing link that someone didn't catch yet is that her foot was the driver. So she thought maybe all she needed was orthotics, and then that would have been the missing link that no one had picked up, So, which is partly why she was coming to me as well from the podiatry. So she had, let's say she was roughly 65 years old and had a tendinosis degeneration of the bicep femoris tendon. Um, I believe it was partially torn as well. Inflammation and instability at the SI joint. That makes sense, right? On the right side because of the sacro tuberous ligament. She started getting groin pain on the right side that's been in the last um, couple years. She was diagnosed with osteitis pubis and an adductor longus tendinosis on that same right side. And then also on that same right side, she has cervical outlet syndrome and she gets numbness all the way down her arm. So kind of big presentations as far as you know what her chief complaints were. When I took a look at her feet, she was completely neutral. And 
didn't need orthotics. I would never give her orthotics, even though she had this instability and, you know, I could have associated it to somehow driving and creating pelvic stability for her. But I was like, this is definitely not a ground up foot core thing. This is something deeper within your T-spine pelvis. So within the, the um, thorax area. And so if this was looked at just from a exteroceptive perspective is it would be easy to look at her presentation and say, okay, you have tendinosis of the bicep femoris. Okay, we need to um, address that with, I suggested stem cells looking at it. Inflammation of the SI joint. She was suggested by other doctors to do prolotherapy to try to tighten the joint. Um, she was recommended, of course, to do physical therapy to inhibit that muscle, strengthen that muscle. So doing a very kind of traditional way of looking at things. Um, recommended to get an epidural for the cervical outlet syndrome. So again, those are all treatment options that are based on exteroceptive um, uh, protocol, let's say. So then I started asking her and I asked her about her breathing and asked her, you know, how so her sleeping is. Does she snore? Does she have sleep apnea? She happens to have sleep apnea. I asked her, her about um, kind of breathing. Does she breathe with her mouth open or does she often, you know, can she find herself where her, her mouth is shut and she's breathing through the nose? She told me that um, she never breathes through her, through her nose, that she's a mouth breather and she has a deviated septum. And so I then started asking even more, asked if she has acid reflux. She does. So all of these are leading into breathing problems and or breathing focused and then diaphragm focused because obviously those are connected, which is then going to bring it back to the way that her body is perceiving homeostasis, safety, right? Safety, we're good. Okay. So we can proceed. If her body doesn't think that it's safe, it's not going to allow her to move. Then I took the homeostasis approach and I watched her walk because I watch all of my patients walk. And of course she had short stochotic steps. She had no pelvic mobility or T-spine mobility and she was apropulsive. Now I could have looked at those things from a, um, again, exteroceptive focused but what I wanted to focus on for her is have her understand that, that there has to be a rhythm in the way that we walk, that we need to have this pelvic mobility and kind of dancing back and forth of the load and the unload, and that it should be a very easy, efficient pattern. Usually when you start to see the breathing, the sleep apnea, the deviated septum, all of these, they have the very... Uh, we'll just call it inhibited gait pattern, which is the lack of long strides, the lack of the fascial recoiling, et cetera. Meaning that you could go back to that safety concept and say that if she's not breathing the right way, deviated septum through her mouth, super diaphragmatic, then her nervous system is not safe if she's in a fight or flight state. And is not going to allow the dynamic movement of ambulation. So they're very much linked. And that's what I wanted her to understand because clearly it's been 30 years. She's seen, you know, I had said probably 15, 20. She's probably seen way more. She's probably seen like a hundred different doctors and specialists and massage therapists and dry needlers. And she's done literally everything under the sun possible and she would get a little bit of relief and then nothing would stick. And that was her biggest thing. So I started asking her, have you ever done anything related to um, truly addressing your breathing, truly addressing stress levels? And then she came out and she said, oh, that she was kicked in her sacrum when she was younger and that's going to be a trauma that is going to stimulate her nervous system so it was a very eye-opening different approach for her which so far we're in an amazing path down this and um 
it's a really great option to start bringing this in with um, our clients and with our patients, especially those who have had pain that long and not getting any relief. It's really great to give them some sort of hope that that's not normal. They don't have to be like that the rest of their, the rest of their life. So what I want to mention next is if you are not familiar with Lois Laney and her restorative breathing is I would 100% check this out. This is very much tying into what I was speaking about with the emotional and the breathing and is the nervous system safe? All of that is is what Lois Laney goes over in her breathing and or in her restorative breathing program. And it's something that she was at the Barefoot Training Summit. She was amazing. She was one of the most eye-opening presenters at that event. And it was it, shortly after that, like the next day back when I was in my patients, I had so many patients that I knew that I could apply these concepts with, even though I had always looked at, is the nervous system safe? Is the nervous system not? But even more so, um, after hearing her speak and the way that she ties it in, I know that it's a really key way of looking at chronic pain patients or movement dysfunction patients. So please do check out her work and um, see if you can tie it in and give some hope or some, uh, some options for those patients that, that may not think that they have any more um, options. So one other last thing that I do want to mention is that once you start looking at patients this way, you can start to see more and more. Um, real quick, another last example, I won't go into details, but was a younger, younger guy, 27 years old, and had severe foot pain and was told me that he couldn't even walk more than like a minute on his feet without severe pain. And had even gone into like a wheelchair. And I was like, what? This kid is 27 and is that bad of foot pain that he is going to go into a wheelchair? Like that, that is starting to go towards a Elodinia type presentation. And immediately the first thing that I said, I wasn't even going to go down and start you know, palpating and ordering MRIs and looking for, you know, do you have degeneration of the plantar fascia? Straight up, what his initial focus is, is I told him that he needs to um, focus on the meditation side and focus on the interoceptive awareness, which we went into how you can listen to your heartbeats, trying to get more into that mind body connection because he is a perfect example of that allodynia because of his stressed state and that his nervous system is not safe. And so it's having an exaggerated response to that pain. So as we wrap up, if you guys have any questions, you can absolutely type those in and I will go over those. And as you um, take this information, I want you to see how, how deeply integrated interoception is and emotion and breathing is linked towards movement dysfunction and, and pain, but try not to bring it just towards uh, diaphragm is inhibiting pelvic floor, therefore you're not stable. Try to keep try to keep it within that interoceptive side and the emotional side and what it's doing to baroceptors and pain response and how you can build that into client programming or patient programming as well. So um, Kennedy had mentioned something about reading a study on diaphragm about analgesic and emotive breeding. I think that is the one that um, I had shared or Jenny had shared. So um, I'm going to include that with the email that I sent to everyone because it's a very good um, eye-opening article that there's not a lot out there that speaks of the diaphragm and emotive breathing in this way. So I'm going to make sure that I include that with everyone.
Perfect. Awesome. If there are no other questions or comments, you may reach out at any point and send those to me. Shoot me an email and I will get back to you on that. And then, of course, always give us your feedback on our education. We're very excited for the rebranding and our um, kind of next level direction with EBFA's education towards the brain, breath, and body, bringing in more of what I just spoke on, interoception and kind of this deeper level of breathing with neuroplasticity and sensory sequencing. So some big things in store for 2018. I appreciate your guys' support and I hope to see you in one of our workshops soon. Take care and have an amazing night. Thank <laughs> you.